والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته oh my god i'm so happy brother where did you find this phone from where did you find this phone that's my phone can i have my phone back please this is my phone can i have my phone back please no it is my phone Do I need to prove it to you or you have to prove it to me that's your phone? No, I, I have it. Why do I have to prove I'm the speaker? Is it this phone? Okay, we have we have a problem here guys. Come on. So our brother is saying that he has to I have to prove it's my phone. Who thinks that I have to prove it's my phone? Everybody else thinks it's my phone, right? Sisters, who has to prove? Is this my phone or his phone? It's his phone? Because I'm telling you, it's my phone. Why doesn't he have to prove it? Because I'm making the claim, okay? Yes, he took it from me. Because you know, when I was trying to prepare and what have you, you just took the phone. Bro, oh, my phone. Okay, that's an important question, right? So, inshallah, what we'll be talking about today, part of that is this issue of who needs to prove I want to get my phone back. Although I have one, but, you know, one more is good. Um, so, inshallah, just the content of today's lecture, bismillah, is going to be about who has to prove. There's something known as the burden of proof in the legal system. So, we're going to talk about a bit about that in relation to God. Uh, we'll talk about, you guys know about a lie detector, right? Has everybody been subject, anybody been subject to a lie detector? Right, so if your wife cooks a nice meal for you and say, you know, it's amazing. Imagine if she starts subjecting to you to a lie detector, right? Or whose food tastes better, your mother's or your wife's? You know, and we are subjected to a lie detector. So we'll talk about that. Uh, then we'll talk about a uh, perfect testing combination with knowledge, desire, choice, and ability. Uh, we'll talk about why tests are important and the different types of tests. And uh, then we'll talk about why, as human beings, we love, do we love falsehood? But sometimes we do follow falsehood, right? So what leads us to following falsehood in one way or the other? Why do we love falsehood? We'll talk about that, inshallah. And then we'll talk about what prevents people from accepting their truth. So that could apply to obviously Muslims as well as non-Muslims. Uh, then we'll talk about the typical cop-outs that people use. And uh, yeah, please close the door. And then we'll talk about why have differences of opinions within Islam, right? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted, he could have made it in a way that there would be no difference of opinion. Right, there would be no way to differ in Islam. If he wanted, he could have done that, right? So what's the hikmah behind that? And then we'll see the mercy and justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how he has made, he has not made falsehood so overpowering. So even though there's falsehood, but it's not overpowering, otherwise we would have been in a much difficult situation. And we'll wrap up. I don't think we'll have time for two other sections, but this is inshallah what I plan to cover. So now coming back to the phone issue, in the legal system, in Canadian legal system or any other legal system, there's a, there's a terminology which is known as burden of proof. So in this situation, although I would love him to prove that this is his phone, but according to the legal system, I have to prove that this is my phone because by default he has it, so it's his. I'm making the claim, so he has to prove, I have to prove that it's my phone. Same thing applies you know, in religion as well. From a perspective of if I was drinking Tim Horton's coffee, where's my coffee? If I was drinking it and you say, say hey, Zubair, how do you know this is halal? Who has to bring a proof? Do I have to bring a proof that it's halal or you have to bring a proof that it's haram? Right? So we have, so you always have within different legal system, you have a notion of in which situation the burden of proof belongs to whom. So now, sometime when we talk about God, or the existence of God, a lot of time people say, hey, prove to me the existence of God. And you know, sometimes we start proving it. 
But the question becomes that who has to prove? Although we have like tons of evidences and proofs uh, for the existence of God, but the question is who has to prove? So that's something to consider. So if you start looking into the notion of uh, the burden of proof or what is also known as self-evident truth in philosophy, it turns out that there's a wide variety of compelling reason that the burden of proof is on the person who denies the existence of God. Not talking about which type of God, but any type of God. The, per the, burden, uh, the burden lies in the person who is denying the existence of God. So there's different ways of looking at it. So by the way, you guys know Elon Musk? How many, how many people know about Elon Musk? Okay, one, two. What about PayPal? Okay, Tesla. So this is the this is the alleged genius mind behind PayPal and Tesla Motors. So he thinks that we are living in a simulation. We are living in a, some type of matrix. We're not real people. You know, we're just living in a simulation. So he thinks that, and he does is like you know his statement on that. So who has to prove? Do I have to now go and prove that? Oh, I'm not in a matrix. I'm a real person. Don't hurt me. Or does he have to prove that we are in a matrix? Same thing applies to the concept of the existence of God. So there are certain notions around that. For example, they say that, look, if something is universal across culture, it's not a culturally dominant thing. Everybody knows it. Everybody believes in it across the culture. It's a universal thing. Uh, if it's something uh, untaught, naturally, naturally learned, uh, it's intuitive. And there are other uh, metrics that determine what is a self evident truth and it's a very strong argument that the existence of God is a self-evident truth meaning that if somebody comes and say hey prove to me that God exists first and foremost he has to prove as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Afillahi is there is there any doubt in Allah is there any doubt about the existence of God nothing right so we're not even going to the point of who Allah is and the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we know him we're just saying the basic thing of existence of God at the moment Okay, so that, that's something, you know, on the side to consider because a lot of time we get into that, you know, circle and we don't even realize that how strong the position is on the existence of God. The reason this happens, by the way, uh, is again, you know, what's in our heart, right? So sometimes we value wealth, status, fame, and power so much that if something comes from a, somebody who has a position of authority, we start feeling weak, right? Well, you guys are, mashallah, very smart. I thought that, you know, I'm going to be sitting on the chair of a speaker and I'll say, it's my phone and you'll support me, but you guys did not. So, but that's the same thing. So imagine if somebody's so powerful, you know, all these, you know, powerful in a sense of what Allah has given them of the world, they make a claim. So we kind of feel shy to ask them for a proof, right? But I hope that everybody would be able to stand up and say to Ilan that, hey, you know what, what's the proof with, you know, us living in a matrix? Anyway, so, so that's on the side. So moving on, basically uh, one of the fundamental things that we have is this lie detector that I was talking about. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us all uh, with a lie detector. And I'm going to give you three different examples for you to understand what this lie detector is. So sometime on Facebook or social media, I now see sometime they put images of and they say that if, if you remember this, your child was what your child was what's beautiful, right? And they may put some brand, they may put some snacks or something that you used to eat as a child, or some toys or cartoons, or even some songs or movies. Has anybody seen something like that on social media? Right? So they'll like, for example, you know, they might put like a floppy disk, right? So some of you know what a floppy disk was, right? And how your computer used to look like and how the telephones were even the mobile phone how, how it used to be right and then when you see those pictures it kind of reminds you back of your childhood days it's not something on the top of your mind you're not thinking about it but when you see those old pictures or those old brands or those old songs kind of reminds you of your you know childhood or young age or what have you so that's one thing uh, so obviously there's a certain thing in, in us because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had a conversation with us, right? In which he asked, am I not your Lord? And all souls agreed to that. 
So that's something innate that we experience. So when we are given the truth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's some sort of recall, re like recollection that we can recall it back and we can kind of connect back to it and it makes sense to us. So that's one angle of it. Second angle, again, I'm going to use a mobile phone example, is this, for example, this has a you know, fingerprint reader, right? So if I put the right finger, it will detect it. So, you know, when I'm sleeping, if, I, my, if my wife wants to read my phone, she can use my finger. She has to know which is the right finger to unlock it, right? But the point being that just like how it has this detection mechanism, our heart has a detection mechanism. So if you give a wrong ideology and say, hey, you know what? The success belongs for you to bow down to this cow or this monkey or this elephant or this big idol. Your heart will find it inconvenient, find it to be uncomfortable. It will not resonate with that truth. So likewise, our heart has the ability to detect lies, to detect falsehood. It gets rusted and it gets corrupted by different things such as society, such as our desires and so on and so forth but essentially it has that essence to detect the truth. So sometimes if it gets rusted, we can clean it by intellectual dialogue, by logic and so on and so forth until it is wide open to be able to recognize the truth. Now the third form, when this fitra is awakened, is as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا غَشِيَهُمْ مَوْجٌ كَالْغُلَرِ دَعَوُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ so when somebody is in immense difficulty and dire need, and he or she sees that, you know what, that's it, I'm going to die, I will be destroyed, there's no help for me. So this is in a sense, for example, especially for people who are traveling by sea, or even traveling by air, and so on and so forth. When you are in this dire need, and you realize there's nobody else that can save you, your intellect is not going to save you, your friends are not going to save you, then the fit rise awaken, and it takes charge, and it takes control. And it's in the driving seat. And then it calls out to the Lord. It calls out to the God. Where does that come from? That's that inner fitra waking up and saying, look, you need to ask for help. You need to stop being arrogant and thinking that you are self-sufficient. And you need to make dua. And you need to ask Allah, that higher power, that higher authority to save you. So these are some examples of that. So the reason I'm saying this, obviously, as the Prophet of Allah وسلم, told us from a hadith that is narrated by Abu Huraira that every child is born on a state of fitra, that beautiful state, that pure state, that inner state of knowing the truth. And then his parents make him a Jew or a Christian or a Magian or so on and so forth. So that's that essence. So how, how is it important? The reason it's important for us is first and foremost to realize that it exists in everyone. So so if you know these 100,000, 2,000 people within your city, within your neighborhood, so on and so forth, they have this fitra. So if they don't know about Allah, the basic thing all you need to do is remind them about it. And for most of the people, it will awaken their fitra. Just like if someone shows you pictures of things or brands or food from your childhood, you would remember that and you would recall that. If you give them the truth of who Allah is, what this life is about, it will awaken the fitra of tons and tons of people. So that's the very basic thing you can do. Inshallah, we, we have a lecture on our YouTube channel. It's called, uh, you don't need to have a doctorate to save souls. So if you, if you watch that, it kind of walks you through of some content, some slides that you can download and just like convey, that's it. If somebody doesn't get it, no problem. You just can convey, show them the pictures, right? In that analogy and move on. Okay, now let's move to you on a, on a th third point of the, of the talk. Okay, do you guys know anybody who is honest? So if I want to do business with someone here, say I want a business partner, do you know somebody who is an honest business partner? Is there anybody who can recommend an honest business partner? I'm not doing business with you, man. You have my phone. Yeah, does somebody know an honest businessman? Okay, how do you know? Okay. Okay. So if the brother had a dealing for 20 years and he didn't see anything bad, uh, you know, anything wrong, any wrongdoing on his part, does that kind of convince you that that person is honest? I'm asking, does that convince you? 
what if he didn't have the opportunity to show his dishonesty? Maybe the brothers installed, you know, CCTV cameras and everything was computerized, so there was no opportunity. So what needs to happen for you to kind of test if somebody is honest? So, so he needs to have an opportunity to be dishonest as well, right? Would you agree? Like, so I'm sure within those 20 years, you would have seen that he had opportunity to be dishonest if he wanted to, and he chose not to be dishonest. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, if there's no opportunity to be dishonest, how would you know, right? It's just that, look, if, I, if I'm working with someone, everything is so tight, Right? There's no way that he can actually be dishonest because everything is computerized. You know, there's no cash involved. Everything is card swiped. You know, even if he wanted to steal some money, he cannot. Even if he wanted to, you know, hide some shipment, he cannot because it's like so computerized. The CCTV, everything is so accountable. Right? There's always somebody with him. Right? So the only way you would have more, uh, more trust in a person when you say that, hey, look, this guy had clear opportunity. To cheat me and if he wanted he could have done that right let's say I trusted him to travel with my goods right and uh, you know something happened and you know for example let's say you know let's say you're traveling and you know uh, something happened to the shipment and things goods get damaged and he says hey you know what alhamdulillah our goods were not damaged because you know I had it in a different compartment they were not damaged because that's a pretty good opportunity because he could say yeah you know what just like everybody else's goods our goods, our merchandise was also damaged. So something like that happens, you kind of see that, look, he had a clear opportunity to be dishonest, dishonest, and he could have sneaked out, but he didn't do that. He chose the higher road, he chose the road of truth. Mm -hmm. True, okay. True. Yeah. So this is like your insight that you have about certain people. Clear. Okay. So now I wanted to kind of go back to this point of another angle of it. So if I say, look, you know what? This child is, mashallah, so beautiful. Right? So when I say this, who am I praising? Right? Does he have, has he had, has he done anything to be actually beautiful? No, yeah, I understand that. Right. But this, you know, if I find him to be, so the point is that, look, if I say he's a hardworking child or he's a hardworking youth, he's an honest, that, that needs metrics, right? That needs that, okay, I have tested him, I've seen him, that like he's a hardworking person, he chose to study when he could have been playing, right? That's something that he made a choice for. But then there's something, for example, it's a child, like, you know, he's just naturally beautiful because that's how Allah created him. So the point I was saying is that, look, if Allah wanted... So the, look at the hikmah, the beautiful way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us. So he has given human beings knowledge, right? So he has given us knowledge about what is the right way, what is the beloved way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and what is the falsehood? What is something that will lead to uh, hellfire, will lead to the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and so on and so forth. And then on top of that, he has given us the ability to choose either or. Right? And then on top of that, what we have is desires. So sometimes our desires would kick in, like, you know, we want to take the easy route. We don't want to work hard, or we want to accumulate more worldly resources. So with this combination is what gives the human being an opportunity to show goodness, to demonstrate goodness, and this is what leads for him to be, happy, to be praised. Because otherwise, it would have been like how I'm saying it's a beautiful child. Because he didn't do anything to be beautiful. 
right? But when we have this opportunity to wake up, let's say it's 6 o'clock, 6.30 and come for Fajr or keep sleeping until we are well rested and until we have to get up for work or school or whatever, what have you, that is a choice and then ability and we know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prefers and what He dislikes. So if you think about it, on all these different options that could have existed, one would be no choice and that is angels. So there's no choice, you know, this, they do, this is how Allah has created them. So it's all praises completely and directly belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they do whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them to do. Now with human beings, it's pretty interesting because now you have choice and ability to take the right way and desires to pull you away from the right way. So such a perfect combination and that is why the human, be human being that does the right thing, he is praised. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions them in front of the angels. Now look at my servant, this is what he's doing. He's remembering me. He's doing, you guys coming here on Saturday afternoon, you could be doing anything, right? Going for a hockey, soccer, just having tea at the restaurant. So that's a choice that we make and do the right thing. That's why we are praised and slowly and slowly and gradually our ranks are increased till by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we actually are placed in the paradise. Now, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not to do that, if you look at the contrary side of it, the opposite side of it, and just have any other combination, you'll see how beautiful and how much wisdom is in this combination that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen for us. So imagine one mistake we do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, hey, you know what, that's it. Now you're going to hellfire because you missed one salah, or you stole once, or you were dishonest once. What we will say? Or oh, just give me one more chance, I'll show you, I'm just going to be so nice. That's it, right? That's why subhanahu, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us such a long time that it's a clear hujjah, it's a clear uh, evidence either for us or against us. So we can't go and say, no, if I had one more day, I would have been so nice. So, so many, one day after day, we get this different opportunities. And as you know, the hadith of Anas bin Malik radiallahu an, that huffat al-jannah bil makar. The jannah, the paradise have been surrounded by things that are hard, that are disliked. And the nar, the hellfire has been surrounded by things that the human being have desires for. So the more difficult it is for us to overcome a certain desire, the more praiseworthy, the higher rank we achieve with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So next, next thing is the importance and types of tests. So without these tests, although Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows exactly what is in our heart, but we could then argue that no, you know, if you would have tested me, I would have been so nice and I would have been so honest and I would have been so pious as the kuffar will do, as the disbelievers will do. And Allah will make their body testify against them. May Allah protect us from this humiliation. So with this, now it gives us an opportunity to see actually where our heart lies. Are we really following our desires? And again, it comes to Muslims as well as non-Muslims. Or are we following the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because everybody says, oh, I love God. But a true love of God means to love what God loves. Okay, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْدِ Every soul will taste death. وَنَبْلُوكُمْ بِالشَّرِّ وَالْخَيْرِ فِتْنَةِ And we test you with evil, with pain, with hardship, as well as with comfort, with goodness. And both of them are a test. So when you are in hardship, that's a test. When you are in comfort, that's a test. وَإِلَيْنَا ثُرُجْعَوْنَ And to us will you be returning. So, if you think about it, when things are hard, why is it a test? Because people don't want to go for hardship. Right? They can't, many people cannot be patient and they starting start to curse their faith. And they start saying, okay, I'm worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why am I being tested? At the same time, many people, when comfort is given to them, they become lazy. Right? They start being lazy, they start becoming, thinking that they are self-sufficient, arrogance kicks in, humbleness goes away, and sometimes people start thinking what? That you know what? Allah is happy with me, that's why I have all these things. But that's not a criteria for Allah to be happy with you or to be angry with you. But then at the same time, there are different types of tests. So mashallah, our brother was saying that you know, he has worked with someone for 20 years, and he has been super honest when it comes to business transactions. So perhaps wealth may not be a test for some people, but something else could be. So when it comes to, for example, women, the person may slip. Or when it comes to power or authority, the person may struggle and be, do whatever is needed 
to maintain the power right so, so just because somebody is honest with one particular angle doesn't mean that he is honest in all other angles so you know from what is attributed to Umar radiallahu an you know when he asked about a man and somebody said that I know him he said like have you traveled with him have you lived with him you know have you done business with him ha have you been his neighbor and he said no she said perhaps you just saw him in the masjid so when you see somebody in the masjid he is taking care of something you know he's taking care of his salah but does not mean that he is you know all set for all the other areas of that you want to test the person for so the point being that there there's various reasons there's various ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us and that has a hikmah and more importantly it has a hikmah for ourselves to use this to see how and where we stand because sometimes we might think okay you know what I'm a good person but when it comes to different types of tests our behavior is different there's something uh, to pay attention to so then the question comes that you know why would one love truth or falsehood right so why do we love truth so that's something that we already talked about actually we have talked about both of them before so the reason that human beings generally love truth is because of that innate nature that fitrah that kicks in they say you know what this makes sense I have to do that and the supporting angels and so on and so forth but when we go for falsehood it's not that we are looking for falsehood but it's because of something that's associated with that falsehood and that is our desires right and that could be desires of any sorts of different things we'll, we'll talk about in a second but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says look in the surah of Naziyat clear criteria that فَأَمَّا مَنْ تَغَى وَآثَرَ الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا so the one who has who is transgressing and he prefers the life of this dunya over the akhirah for him is what jahannam so his destiny his final resting place would be the hellfire but so the one who fears the standing in front of his lord and he denies and prevents his nafs for just falling on the desires that person will have the Jannah, the Paradise as the final abode. So what we have talked so far again, as a recap, so you see where we are in that whole thing, is obviously we started talking about the issue of who needs to prove what, right? So when we come to the statement of does God exist, who has to prove one way or the other? Do I have to prove or the other person has to prove that God does not exist? Okay, we talked about the lie detector, the fitra that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with. And we see that the beautiful combination that Allah has created by giving us knowledge, choice, ability, and desires. So if you take any of those things away, it will be totally different world and it will be totally different understanding. And you wouldn't be able to see this beautiful, comp complete picture. So now you have knowledge and you have the ability and you have two opposing forces. The love of Allah or the love of desires. Okay, we talked about the importance and the types of tests and the essence of why we love truth of our falsehood. So now the next topic we'll look at, you know, what prevents people from accepting the truth. And this is very important, as I said, because it applies to everyone. So not just because of non-Muslims, but even Muslims, whenever there is a disagreement or difference, this thing kicks in. So it's super important. So what happens... And this is uh, a lot of this is coming from a beautiful book. Uh, it's called uh, Al Qaid ila Tasih al Aqaid, right? So, the the guide to the correctness of the belief. So, and and a beautiful work, very intelligent work that was done. So he mentions there that look, when you acknowledge truth, that means that you were upon falsehood. So if you realize if somebody comes to you and say, look, this is something wrong, and this is how things should be done. If you accept that person's call, you're also acknowledging that in the past, you were on falsehood. And that's a very hard thing for a lot of people to do. On top of that, you're also acknowledging that your beloved ones, your leaders, or your forefathers, or your masters, the people that you consider in a high rank, they were wrong. It could be your teachers, what have you, right? So you are, you're acknowledging that as well. So this becomes a very hard thing for people to overcome. Uh, sometimes people wouldn't do that because they have some sort of a financial or fame authority or some sort of societal status associated with that falsehood so they have a followership 
And if they quit, they will lose that all. And that also happens a lot. And sometimes it could be just arrogance, meaning that the person that's telling you the truth, you know, this is a kid, right? Or a low person in the society from a wealth perspective, how can he or she correct me? So that will kick in and then you will not accept the truth. Um, sometimes it could also be related to jealousy. And sometimes it's just that, you know, it's not coming from my people, right? Not my ethnicity. Uh, for some people, it's even gender. It's, it's a male saying it. It's not a female saying it and vice versa, right? Uh, not my ethnicity, not my religion, and so on and so forth. So there's, and we saw that, for example, with Bani Sarai as well, right? Because they wanted a prophet, but it's not one of us. So same thing applies in different angles and different situations to us uh, Muslims as well. Uh, another very important thing actually from a spiritual perspective is as we reject truth once, so we see a clear proof and we reject it, we don't accept it, it becomes harder to accept it the next time. So the more we reject the truth, the harder it becomes. Same thing applies again for non-Muslims, for us as well. When truth is given to us, we keep ignoring. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنُقَلِّبُ أَفْئِدَتَهُمْ وَأَبْصَارَهُمْ كَمَا لَمْ يُؤْمِنُ بِهِ أَوَّلَ مَرْوَةً So we turn their hearts and their sight, just like they did not believe in the first time. So bringing more signs, more evidences, more miracles will not help them because that's how their hearts are being sealed of, because of their continual uh, desire and their continual uh, denials. So now because we have all these essence, these all negative characteristics in our souls, it's important to be aware of so that we know what is kicking in and what is preventing us from accepting the truth. At the same time, being aware of it when you are giving da'wah to someone, whether a Muslim or a non-Muslim, to be aware of these conditions, these uh, elements that prevent someone from accepting truth. So you can speak in a way that they don't feel is coming from you. For such some time, you have to ask questions in a way that they feel that they are discovering it rather than you are telling them. So it depends from a person to person. You have to be careful about how you communicate. You don't have to be. You can just go straight up, tell the truth, you know, share the truth and awaken the fitzah. But something to be careful about. And also, this fifth point is important for them to realize that, look, if I'm ignoring the guidance, if I'm ignoring the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, next time I may not see it. So it's, and same thing applies to us. Somebody shows you a proof that, look, brother, look, this is haram, and we try to find a cop out, as we will see next, then it becomes hard for our heart to actually see the truth. Okay, so now, what are typical cop outs that people take? So now, because you have these things, you want to follow your desires, right so typical thing that people say take is basically have a false belief you know oh this is not haram plus it's not haram it does not apply in this society it does not apply in you know canada it applies in like a muslim country so on and so forth easy right because you have to justify what you want so this is how sometimes people get in and that's how you know things happen differences come in the religion other things that people use is find shortcuts right so that's why you know people would have intercessors you know i go to the you know grave of such and such person that person will save me he will intercede for me or i just need to do this thing and i'll have the intercession for from the prophets or from you know the awliya and so on and so forth people like to have these type of shortcuts within muslims as well as non-muslims right you know i just believe in the crucifixion and you know that's good i'm good kappa um other thing that people do oh you know what i just love god it's a kappa right i mean if you love god why don't you love what God loves? And why don't you search and research what God loves? And so on and so forth. But then the question comes in, if somebody were to ask that, hey, you know what, if Allah wanted, the, within the Muslim community, there would be no way for a cop-out. Right? So let's say it's so clear. So right now, for example, praying five prayers a day. For the most part, it's so clear, right? Nobody differs on that. I mean, there's, there's a group that differs on that. But in general, it's so super crystal clear that if you say it, you don't have to pray five times a day, you will be clearly out of the jama'ah. Right? But there are certain things that are, people have made a way, they have a, you know, they have an argument, they have a logical deductions around it, and they, they can make a point. Right? So these type of things, if one were to ask, if Allah wanted, it would have been crystal clear like that, that either you follow or you're clearly known as 
a hypocrite are clearly known as a fasik, clearly known as a disobedient person. But you don't have that, right? You have this gray areas where people can find ways and do it. The hikmah behind it, if you think about it, is this also gives opportunity for our, our self-cleansing to see, look, I had the opportunity to take that path, to take that easier path. And I know it's not, I'm not comfortable with it. I know it doesn't look like it's true, but I'm taking it because nobody can blame it to me because I can just say, hey, you know what? Yeah, there are scholars that support the view that I'm taking. So that's another thing that Allah has made as a test. And it shows us that are we trying to find that shortcut for whatever fatwa it may be and just taking that, you know, that, that way. So you see this, the, the hikmah behind it, how beautiful it becomes, right? Because if it wasn't there, then you may have that nifaq inside you and you wouldn't even realize that and you wouldn't even work on cleansing it. Now, from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just like in certain situations, uh, truth is not super clear, it's not compelling, you have a way of a cop-out. Same way, he has not made falsehood compelling. What do I mean by that? So imagine if everybody who does not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who does not obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, was a millionaire or a billionaire. Everyone. Right? And no one from the Muslim would have that authority. That would be a very big trial. Right? So this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in uh, that that لَجَعَلْنَا لِمَنْ يَكْفُرُ بِالرَّحْمَانِ لِبُيُوتِهِمْ سُقُفًا مِنْ فِضَّةِ وَمَعَارِجَ عَلَيْهَا يَظْهَرُونَ If it were not, that the people would become one nation upon falsehood. If not everybody would become, you know, a disbeliever. We would have made for those who disbelieve, their houses would have ceilings and stairways of silver. Right? So you see that that would be a, such a big trial. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed it in a way that it's not super compelling. You have disbelievers, you have sinners who are rich and powerful, and you have believers and Muslims and obedient people who are rich and powerful. And you have those who don't have that. So this is a good combination. Otherwise, it would have been very appealing and a clear, you know, a big test for many people. So you see, when you see the balance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created of the shahwat, the desires, and the truth, and what calls to truth, is such a beautiful combination that you have this option of sabr, taking the sabr route, being patient with it, and take the higher route. So with this, now what comes basically as, as a summary is what, why we're trying to discuss that is we're kind of going back from a historical perspective on the creation of human being and different things that are associated with the human being and the test that we have within this dunya and the different components. So we have our desires, we have the knowledge, we have the lie detector, the fitra, and we have you know, some different areas that we talked about. So the idea is that how can we use that to awaken the fitra of people around us? So, a lot of people, if you start talking to people, they have these deep questions about why am I here, where am I going, you know, when will there be justice, how do I understand all this, you know, injustice around me, all this variation in the distribution of wealth and power and health and sickness, uh, what is being successful, what is being, you know, validated, what is being approved, and... Uh, and so on and so forth. So people need answers to the very important question is like, why should I continue living? A lot of people have this question, why should I continue living? They don't see a hope in the future. So a lot of people have this question. We see a small, very small percentage of people that, ha that deny the truth and they're very arrogant and they will actually fight back to the truth. But a lot of people are very neutral and very open to answers. So, you know, once we understand the framework, once we understand what's going on, we can practice and inshallah present to the people and the goal we're trying to do is unrest and awaken the fitra, awaken that lie detector. So one way of doing that, you know, speaking of the history, is 
to go back to the creation of the human being. And that conversation that took place between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, angels, Satan, and um, um, and uh, the creation of Adam alayhi salam and how Adam alayhi salam was put into paradise and how he was tested and how he was forgiven. And now we are here to kind of demonstrate and use this opportunity to fight our desires and take the higher route, route take the higher road of with patience to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and follow what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, commanded. So this is kind of what I wanted to share with you guys. I uh, hope that you found some interesting and beneficial ideas that will help us first and foremost to realize that when I am presented with the truth, when the ayahs and hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa is recited to me, narrated to me, do I follow the truth or and how I basically fight my desires because desires will be there and the success will be for the person who actually takes that higher route and uh, fight the desires and then the next level is how do I now take this and share it with people um, around me so shall I'll conclude with that and subhanakallahumma uh, bihamdik shalwa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk jazakumallahu khair and So we have a lecture after Maghrib. Is there any questions? I, I didn't prepare for any questions, so we can see if it's easy enough. Yeah, if there's any questions that I can take, inshallah, I'll try. Can I, have, can I have my phone back? No. Any questions? I'll Yes. Mm. I have, I have no I mean I, I have no comments on that I mean obviously we know that you know what is haram is haram is clear right but now on the other side the people have a pretty strong argument as well right so the point is that people are able to come up with an argument it's not that they're just pulling something from thin air right so I'm not saying what is right or wrong that's that's not for me to you know inshallah you can ask them a shaykh when they're here that is way beyond my position but the point was that people are able to come with a logical deduction of whatever claim that they're trying to make right that ability is something if Allah wanted could have prevented it right so it could be as clear as saying that you know there's five prayers right but that ability itself presents this opportunity for a test because everybody has different sorts of things that they're weak towards and it's because when Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anh, he is worried about the, is he a munafiq or not, it's, it's so crucial for us to think that, you know, am I only following Islam when it's convenient? So that's a, that's a hikmah that the, the writer was sharing that with this ability, uh, ability to come up with something that is uh, potentially can be made a claim. So you can, you can have clear claim that, you know, this is haram. But you also have an argument that this is permissible in this and that condition and what have you. This ability, the existence of this ability is a test within itself, which has a great wisdom behind it. So sometimes we say, you know, why, why is it like that? But if you see that is a great wisdom behind it, because this now gives another opportunity to see that, can I put my desires away and still follow the truth? Is that answer your question so I don't think your question was that but I was just trying to clarify that my point was this right. any other questions I think, okay inshallah and uh, we'll continue after Maghrib